remnants of the Italian New Left, um, like those of the New Left elsewhere in Western Europe, can be traced back to 1956. In the Italian case, the events of 1956 had a major impact on the Partito Socialista Italiano, the PSI, not just the Partito Comunista Italiano, PCI. Indeed, they had a more direct impact on the PSI. There were three main strands within the Italian New Left in the years leading up to 1968, uh, which are Operaismo, the Pursuit, and the Ingrao Left, all of which might be seen as specifically Italian, in contrast uh, to the less important currents of Orthodox Maoism and Trotskyism in the years leading up to 1968, which do exist in Italy, just as they do elsewhere in Western Europe, but I'm not going to say anything about them today. Um, I will start by saying something about Operaismo. Whilst Operaismo could be, and sometimes is, very literally translated into English as workerism, its distinctiveness, its overwhelming emphasis on struggles within the factory, at the point of production, is better conveyed by keeping to the Italian word. The reason I'm starting with Operaismo is um, that by 1969, this movement had given rise to two of the main organizations of the Italian revolutionary left, Lotta Continua and Patere Operaio. Operaismo was an ideology that can be, trans tra can be traced back to the late 1950s and initially involved intellectuals in or close to the PSI rather than the PCI. The beginnings of this tradition coincide with the PSI's move away from close organizational and political links with the PCI in the wake of 1956. But unlike the dominant trend in the PSI, the one associated with the party leader Pietro Neni, the Operaisti were not moving towards more conventional Western European <coughs> social democracy. The intellectuals involved in Operaismo placed a great deal of emphasis on the northern Italian factories, industrial relations at the point of production, and the emergence of a new unskilled assembly, a new type of unskilled assembly line worker the Operaio Massa, as they call it. In the course of the Italian economic miracle of 1958 to 63. Within a few years, these intellectuals moved out of the orbit of the PSI, as the PSI itself moved towards a governmental compromise with Christian democracy. This trajectory is probably most clearly exemplified by the case of Renato Panzieri, the founding father of the tradition that gave rise to classic operaismo, even if Pansieri himself did not go all the way with the younger and more extreme proponents of this set of ideas. Pansieri was appointed co-director of the PSI theoretical journal Mondo Operaio in early 1957, but lost this post as a result of the 33rd Congress of the PSI in 1959, which moved sharply towards an alliance with the DC. Pansieri set up a new journal, Quaderni Rossi, uh, Red Notebooks, um, whose first number came out on the 30th of September 1961. While Pansieri's emphasis on the working class rank and file was in large measure a product of his own political experience. Romano Alquati and other writers associated with Quaderni Rossi were drawn towards sociology in part under the influence of the French Socialismo or Barbarie, which I mentioned in part because I've already in virtual would be sure, uh, and the emotion group associated with CLR James, uh, because of, uh, I mentioned those because Christian would doubtless remind me of the connection, even if I didn't mention it. If, uh, if Quaderni Rossi's birth was a response to the economic miracle um, the splintering of its editorial collective was a result of the Piazza Statuto, workers' riot in Turin in July 1962. Pansieri, already under attack from the official left as an alleged instigator of this riot, was not keen on the total hostility towards trade unions and left parties displayed by those who a bit later became operaisti. By the time of Pansieri's death in October 1964, he 
Pansieri was an isolated figure. Although Quaderni Rossi outlived him by four years, the journal had lost its former influence. Classic operaisma was really devised by the new journal, Classe Operaia, working class, associated with Mario Tronti. Classe Operaia began in 1964 and ended in 1967, but after 1966, it too was wrapped by a split as the Roman group associated with Tronti adopted an entryist perspective in relation to the PCI. Antonio Negri, who had some connection with both journals, that is, with any Rossi and Classe Operaia, from late 1961, emerged as the leading figure, Poterio Operaio Veneto Emiliano, which was in due course to become a national organisation, Poterio Operaio, as a result of his in, emerging in this role as a result of his involvement in day-to-day -day <coughs> struggles in local factories, particularly in Porto Maguera, uh, big chemical factories near Venice. Insofar as operaismo uh, influenced the student movement of 1967 to 68, in particular via the Pisan theses of 1967, it was through the younger intellectual, uh, younger than Negri, uh, Adriano Sofri, whose Lata Continua began life before, 19, before his 1969 split with Negri as Potere Operaio Toscano. Okay, that's my potted history of operaismo. The second grouping within the Italian New Left before 1968, which I intend to say something about today, is the pursuit the Partito Socialista di Unità Proletaria. The pursuit originated in 1964 as a left-wing split from the PSI, from the main socialist party, in response to the decision by the PSI leader Pietro Neni and the party majority to enter a coalition government with the Christian Democrats, something which I've already referred to, at least in passing, when discussing Pansieri's trajectory away from the PSI. The pursuit was always a rather strange hybrid, um, something which has given rise to varying opinions about the pursuit's relation to the new left. Some writers have compared it to the French PSU, uh, whilst others have been inclined to dismiss its members as caristi, uh, which is the Italian equivalent of tachis. Um, because of the stance the party leadership took over the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in August 68. The core of the pursuit's national leadership, Tullio Vecchietti, Dario Valori and Vincenzo Gatto, had come from the left of the PSI, in which a current hostile to Neni's rightward shift towards the DC had coalesced <coughs> after 1959, so they'd been together as a, as a current really from 1959 <coughs> to 64. Um, on the other hand, a number of the pursuit's local leaders, particularly the younger ones, looked to the new movements that emerged in Italy's universities and Italy's factories between 1966 and 1969. Some of the latter groups, such as Mauro Rostagno, who played a leading role in the student movement in Trent, uh, and Luigi Bobbio, who played a similar role in Turin, uh, ended up, both of these two guys, ended up in the leadership of the much more avowedly revolutionary organization Lotta Continua, founded in 1969. Although the pursuit as a whole, as distinct from some individuals who passed through its ranks, was never pro-Chinese. It had a more third-worldist orientation than the PCI, than the uh, official Communist Party. For example, it took a very hard line on Vietnam, basically victory to the Vietnamese, and at certain stages supported the Cubans' criticism of the more orthodox Communist parties on the Latin American mainland. <coughs> It's worth pointing out that the highest vote the pursuit ever obtained coincided almost exactly with the French May, French May of 68. Um, on 
The 19th of May 1968, the pursuit won 4.5% of the vote uh, and 23 seats in the Chamber of Deputies. This is an Italian general election. This was undoubtedly the result of its enthusiastic and positive response to the Italian student movement of 1967-68, even if it failed to keep the support of the younger generation for any length of time. Whether the pursuit's ultimate failure to become the party of the Italian New Left was due to generational factors, uh, since its core membership uh, were older workers from the CGIL Trade Union Confederation. Older workers uh, who had originally been the P in the PSI who didn't want to break the alliance with the PCI. Whether it was due to these generational factors or to a financial reliance on Soviet funds uh, to sustain 500 full-timers in a party that never achieved its 200,000 <laughs> membership target is hard to judge. So it could have been a generational thing, or you could argue that it's, it's the community that, uh, and the Soviet plans. Anyway, the third and last force that I intend to discuss um, this afternoon, or you, is the in-ground left within the PCR. Some claim that at its peak in 1966, this, the Ingro left, had the support of about 20% of the PCI's membership, which is certainly far more than the handful of operaista entries around Mario Tronti mentioned a little earlier. Whilst Pietro Ingro, who is obviously the leader of the Ingro left, may not have always been happy with the line of the PCI's long-standing leader, Palmiro Togliatti, in the period after 1956. It was only after Togliatti's death in 1964 that Ingrau really emerged as the consistent advocate of a distinct line. Ingrau advocated greatly increased inner party democracy within the PCI, and he was very critical of the Soviet Union which he saw as no model for socialism in Italy. But he was opposed to any drift towards social democracy, and he placed uh, his emphasis on alliances with progressive forces within civil society, rather than on top-down political deals with either the PSI or the DC. The Ingra left, to some extent, mirrored the operaisti in placing a great deal of emphasis on the way Italian society had changed during the economic miracle, which, as I said before, sort of 58 to 63. Uh, in this respect, the Ingra left displayed a much more realistic grasp of how Italy was evolving than the PCI's right and the PCI's centre, which continued to harp on about the ways in which Italy was still allegedly backward or semi-feudal. However, Ingrao's main opponent, Giorgio Amendola, the leader of the PCI right wing, was a far more skillful political operator than Ingrao. Ingrao's call for, quote, the publicizing of the debate, unquote, in the run-up to the 11th PCI Congress in January 1966, did Ingrao a lot of damage at the higher levels of the party uh, who hated the idea of publicising debates, whilst many ordinary <coughs> PCI members probably remain unaware of the substantive issues at stake in the debate. Ingrao's defeat at the Congress in '66 led to quite an extensive purge of his supporters on the editorial boards of various um, party magazines and journals, as well as the ousting of Rosanna Rosanda from her key position uh, in cultural matters. In the years between 1966 and 1969, some of Ingrao's supporters, such as Rosanna Sanda, Luigi Pinto, Luciana Castellina, and Lucia Margri took their critique of the party leadership 
further than Ingrao himself. These younger leftists were eventually expelled from the PCI as a result of the positions they set out in their journal Il Manifesto in 1969. Ingram's loyalism to the PCI actually extended to endorsing the expulsion of his own more radical followers in 1969. Ingram remained uh, a member of the PCI until its dissolution in 1991. Never left the party. But it would be wrong to neglect the impact of Ingram's ideas on the new left, uh, particularly on Il Manifesto, and I'd also say eventually on Rifondazione Comunista via uh, Fausto Bertinotti, and indeed possibly the left Euro communism of uh, Ingram could be seen as having influenced Syriza in much more recent uh, times. Um, I know I haven't covered the in, entire spectrum of, of the Italian New Left, but I think those three groups, the Operaisti, the Pursuit, uh, and uh, the Ingra Left uh, are the main things. The Pursuit itself dissolves in 72, and its majority goes into the PG, into the PCI. Um, but a few of the, of the people involved eventually go on to be involved in Democrats and Politarians. It's another story and comes out with something else, but I think why do you operate from my living house?